Thanks for that introduction. <laughs> Appreciate that. All right, good afternoon, everyone. And um, so the, obviously the theme today is beyond. And you know, I, I thought about how I was going to start this and introduce. And then I got to sit and listen to Mark Wood get up here and perform and talk. And I thought to myself, isn't that perfect for the theme, that you had this, this free spirit, creative genius that comes up here and presents himself, and then you got someone like me. <laughs> so not to say that I might not be a free spirit or creative genius, but certainly when I walk up here um, in, my, uh, in my uniform and dress like this, it's a, certain, it's a certain image you think about. And that's why the theme of Beyond is going to be perfect for what I talk about, is I talk about non-lethal weapons within the military. And the other ones, th these words up here, uh, innovate, adapt, and win. About six months ago, we got a new leader in the Marine Corps. Uh, General Joe Dunford came out of Afghanistan and took over as the Commandant of the Marine Corps. He put out his planning guidance. And these are the words that he uses in his planning guidance that he tells us in the Marine Corps of what we need to do. We need to be innovative. We need to adapt what we do in order to, in order to win. But the other word I want to talk about before I get into the meat of this is the word oxymoron. Because that's, if you, if you think about it on the surface, that's what non-lethal weapons in the military are. It's, it, it, it's an oxymoron. But my job today is to try to give you some, some thoughts about what we do, about why we have non-lethal weapons, about the certain weapons that we have, and where we're going in the future to show you that it's not an oxymoron. It's a, it's a complementary tool set with uh, some of the other weapon systems that we have in the military. Um, so let me, show you a, uh, let me show you a quick video up here of the, um, and what this is, is this is what I did for on and off for, first, um, for the first 17 years of my career. And I show this for two reasons. The first one is because it's really cool and I want to brag about what I did. So let's, let's get that out. But the, um, the second reason, more illustrative of the points that I'm going to make today, is that's the Harrier is what we think about when we think about the military. When I say we, I'm being inclusive. I'm, I'm, I'm talking about those of us currently in the military, those of us that have spent time in the military and got out, and those of us that have never spent any time in the military at all. As we think of the military as weapon systems like the Harrier, like tanks, like aircraft carriers, fighting these major wars like World War II, Korea, Desert Storm. That's what we think about the military. And let me make this clear as I talk more about non-lethal weapons. That's our job in the military is to fight and win the nation's wars. That's why we have a military, is to, to go into those situations and win. But a little secret for you. That's not what we do all the time. In fact, that's not what we do most of the time. We're asked to do a ton of other missions as well. We ask our men and women in the military to um, do peacekeeping operations, stability operations, humanitarian assistance, disaster relief. And when we do those other missions, we need other tool sets that are complementary to things like the Harrier and these other major weapon systems. And that's where non-lethal weapons fit in very nicely. So when you think about a disaster, be a man-made disaster, natural disaster, so earthquakes, typhoons, tsunamis, things like that, um, those can come through. And in a lot of places where they hit, after that disaster happens, food and water scarce, the ability to move around, roads, bridges, airports can be damaged, destroyed. Um, access to medical supplies can be non-existent. The, the population that, gets, that get hit, gets hit by some of these disasters are, are devastated. They need help immediately. Now, fortunately, there's a ton of organizations out there to do that. Think of USAID, um, the Red Cross, Red Crescent, uh, Doctors Without Borders, there's tons of these organizations that are here to help. But if that infrastructure is destroyed, they just can't just come in there. And that's where we come in in the military, is because we can come in and rapidly build up um, all of the things you need. Come in, you know, uh, helicopters and vehicles, and um, we bring food and water, electricity. I mean, you name it, we bring it, and we bring it immediately. And we can sustain ourselves. We can then allow those organizations to come in and help people that need help. So I've stopped in this picture up here for a reason. And what I want you to do is I want to use this to illustrate two different points of view as we get into why we really need non-lethal weapons in these situations we come into. So look at that crowd up there. And I want you to put yourself in their situation. And just imagine that it's a couple of days after a natural disaster. Um, they're starving. They're thirsty. They may be injured. Their homes are destroyed. Loved ones have been lost. They're, they're desperate, and they need help. 
But even more than that, think of the moms and dads in that crowd. Their children are starving. So they're, and now the military's come in with help, and they're desperate to get it. So if you think about crowd dynamics, the folks, and that's not a very large crowd, even much, much larger ones sometimes. The folks in the back can be pushing forward to get to those supplies. That situation can get rapidly out of hand. So now shift your perspective and think about those young men and women in the military that, that are there to help. We've told them, hey, there's been this disaster here. People need help, and your job's going and help them. Your job's going and save lives. Well, the only tool set we've given them are those major weapon systems and lethal force. We put them in a very difficult situation when that crowd starts to get out of hand and they have to, to, to protect themselves and protect the folks in the crowd. So that's where the non-lethal weapon come in. That's why it's so important that we have these complementary tool sets within the military so we can do missions like this. Now, I, I could go on and on because non-lethal weapons fit in across the spectrum as we go forward. <laughs> Quite sure what that was, but um, I might need to answer my phone. Oh. There we go. So happy birthday to Anne. Um, yeah. So, but uh, my, my point was that, um, so that's just, that's just one area, that humanitarian assistance disaster relief where we, we need non-lethal weapons. But they fit across that entire spectrum of military operations we do to include sometimes in, uh, in major combat operations as we go through. I just can't get into all those because, again, we'd be here for, um, for about two days. So let me talk now about some of the existing non-lethal weapons that we have. And again, I'm only going to brush the surface on these because we have so many that we have fielded. And the other thing that, as I talk about these existing systems, the word oxymoron is going to come back into play. Because again, I'm the director of the DOD's Joint Non-Lethal Weapons Program. And what I'm about to talk to you about three systems, um, the one theme is you're going to say, well, he didn't talk about weapons at all. But this is the Department of Defense. And everything has to have a name, and the name for this stuff is weapons. So that's what it's called. Um, so the first, so again, go back to that situation where the infrastructure is destroyed. We're coming in in our helicopters. People who need help, they see our helicopters coming in. They're going to naturally start to, um, to come towards where they see the helicopters landing. Now, what we need to do is we need to get in there, um, get set up, get organized with the supplies, get those agencies in that help folks. And we need to have security as we go forward. So the first thing we want to do as people start to approach our position is let them know, hey, we're here. That's just the, the, the basic thing. So what you see up there is that's a eye safe green dazzling laser. And what it does, it reaches out hundreds of meters and just simply lets, lets people know, hey, there's something up ahead that I need to pay attention to. So, so good, but mm, utility can be a little bit questionable if it's just that. But also on that vehicle, which you really can't see because you're being dazzled by the laser, is a um, acoustic hailing device. And what that does is that projects intelligible voice hundreds of meters away. So we can tell folks, hey, we need you to you know, stop where you are. You know, we'll start distributing food, and whatever it's going to be. But we can actually send instructions out to folks to let them know um, what's going on. Now, that's a fantastic capability until you get someone like me that's projecting my voice. Because unless I'm out here on the, uh, on the grounds here, in Williamsburg, and I'm talking to you guys, which hopefully you understand me. Um, so I'm embarrassed to admit this, but um, despite the fact that I graduated from high school in Naples, Italy, spent uh, two years living over there, and I went to an American school, um, my grasp of Italian is atrocious. And that's the best language that I speak besides English. So that, that ability to project voice is not going to do you much good if you can't project it in a voice that people can understand. And that's why we have our third non-lethal weapon, again, not really weapons, but is this device right here. And just like in the, uh, in the Star Trek, well, you, you guys look, most of you look a little uh, young to remember the Star Trek TV shows, but um, maybe uh, Star Trek movies or the Big Bang Theory, they talk about Star Trek all the time, dress up. <laughs> so in Star Trek, they have um, universal translators. So as they go to different planets, they can communicate with folks. And that's kind of what this device is. It's the latest in translation devices that we have in the military. Um, multiple languages loaded in here and for basic one-way instruction, and a few, a few less languages in here so you can actually do two-way conversation. Um, so let me see if I can get this. So standing up here trying to use technology can be dangerous, but I'm going to give this thing a shot. So, so if I want to say, um, stop the vehicle now, 
Stop the vehicle now. Firma il veicolo ora. So there it is. So that's in Italian. So you, you can, we can actually tell people and communicate with them uh, in their language that they understand as we go forward. So again, that's just really brushing a few of the non-lethal capabilities that we have. We have a lot more that are fielded out there. And they do, those would fall more into the categories of traditionally what you would think of as a weapon system. Um, but I want to take just a few minutes and talk to you about the future and where we're going. Because this is really an area that I think is exciting. And that's in the, that's in the directed energy realm. So let me show you a, um, a quick clip here about our, in our active denial system, which we actually have fielded this out there. So what you did not see up there is you did not see a 95 gigahertz millimeter wave beam of energy, it's about, about that big, hitting those, uh, those are actually Marines in civilian clothes up there. Um, that's what you didn't see because it's a, it's a silent, invisible beam of energy, it goes out 1,000 meters, and because it's a millimeter wave, it only penetrates the 64th inch into your skin, and it causes an intolerable heating sensation to come up your body. So you're just standing there, and all of a sudden your body just, um, just, I believe it's to 44 degrees Celsius that your body heats up. And it's what we call a universal compelling effect, which means that it acts the same way on everybody, and it compels you to stop what you're doing immediately and move. Now, we have, not, not just in this, we have two of these systems that we've built prototypes of. Um, we've engaged over 11,000 volunteers with it. Um, and not just in this system, but in all of the systems we have fielded and we're developing, we do extensive scientific and medical research to truly understand the effects of these systems. Because there's no point in building a non-lethal weapon system that's going to go out and kill everybody that you use it on. It defeats the purpose. So we really want to understand these things. And so not only do we do the research, and, uh, both scientific and medical, but we have it peer-reviewed as well. And we peer-reviewed outside of DOD, so we're not checking our own homework. Um, so much so that I feel so comfortable with this system that I've been engaged by it a number of times. And I gotta tell you, when you, we're standing there and you get that, that just immediate heating sensation, um, there, there's two things you do. Well, as a Marine, there's two things. First is you get out of the way as quickly as possible. And the second thing is you discipline yourself not to um, scream out loud. So, and I, I wanna assure everybody that I, I did not scream when I was shot by it. So, but, th but those types of technologies, as we move forward into the future and we talk about why we need non-lethal weapons and how important they are. It's just, it just such a, um, it just, they're just so, such useful technologies. Um, one of the, the Army calls that a shove capability. Because if you think if you're in a, um, an urban environment and lots of people are around your vehicles and you need to get them out of the way, you can use that capability just to gently shove them aside and do what you need to do. We're also going, um, using direct energy, different types, not millimeter wave, but different types of direct energy to go after um, vehicles and vessels to disable them. So you put direct energy on a, uh, on a vehicle or vessel and it, um, it basically stalls it out until you take that energy off that it can drive away. So very, very interesting places that we're, uh, that we're going. Um, so listen, I, I want to thank you for your attention today as I got a chance to kind of share hopefully a, a, a different part of the military that maybe you haven't thought about, but a very, very important part. Um, as I said, our job is to fight and win our nation's wars. And we build weapon systems and we train our men and women to do that. But we're also asked to do a lot of other things. And you know, as, a, as the Commandant asked us to do is, we need to be innovative and adaptive as we move into the future so that as we ask these young men and women in our military to do these different missions, that we give them the tools so that they really can be successful as they do it. So again, thank you very much for having me and thank you for your attention today.